Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast. My name is Philip and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 41. Seneca's Medea. Beware pure evil. Last time, Seneca and Roman tragedy took centre stage with a look at his life and times, and what times they were. Seneca was already in the throes of Roman political life when Caligula became emperor and narrowly escaped a death sentence from him. He was exiled under Claudius, but found favour again through Agrippina, and had most influence as Nero's tutor and then advisor in the early years of his reign. Nero took Rome through some of its most chaotic years, with the effects of his youth and excesses that verged on madness, resulting in matricide and a coup that ended a dynasty, and much else. Seneca was a key player in the palace in the early years of Nero's reign, at times trying to curb Nero's wilder demands and actions, at others being an apologist for them. They were difficult times to say the least and, in the end, Seneca was a victim of them, and of Nero in particular. His plays were certainly a reflection of his times and are not known for their subtlety or delicacy. Quite the opposite, in fact. So, the choice of the legend of Medea as a subject is not in the least bit surprising. Let's see what he made of it. Seneca's eight-year exile in Corsica is thought to have been the result of court jealousies, and particularly those of Empress Messalina, wife of Claudius, in an attempt to discredit her political rivals, as I recounted in the last episode. So creating a character of a woman driven by desperation, a desire for vengeance, and a searing hatred of those who had betrayed her may have come quite easily to him. As you will remember from the Euripides version, the background of the play is that Jason met Medea during his quest for the Golden Fleece. To save him, she killed her father and joined him on his travels. She was then instrumental in his successes on several occasions as they travelled back towards Thebes. They married, despite the difficulties that presented with Medea being a foreigner, and she bore him two children. Once settled back in Thebes, Jason started a political career and as a means of advancing himself, he has abandoned Medea and courted Creusa, daughter of King Creon. The play opens with Medea cursing her husband, the king and his daughter. Here is a flavour of the opening speech, a passage following where she has made an incantation to the gods. It was by Hecate that Jason swore his faith, and yet I should rather invoke the chaos of eternal night, that realm opposed to the celestial powers, filled with abandoned souls. Persephone, queen of that dusky realm, betrayed by bitter faith, I invoke you in my dark sadness. Approach, approach avenging goddess with snake hair, holding your sulphurous torch in blood-stained hands. Come now, as terrible as you were when you stood beside my marriage bed. Bring death to the new bride, to the royal seed, and to Creon. But for Jason I ask worse. Give him life so that he can roam in fear, through unknown lands, an exile, hated, poor, and without a home. And so it goes on, some sixty lines of invective and curse. After this solo opening, the chorus of Corinthian women enter. They are singing a wedding song to celebrate the marriage of Jason and Creusa. The celebration antagonises Medea further, and in a scene with the nurse, she tells of how she supported Jason through his quest and performed deeds that meant he was successful in all his endeavours, where he would otherwise have failed. She also pointedly blames Creon for overstepping his powers by annulling their marriage and breaking the most sacred and strongest ties, those between husband and wife and mother and children. The nurse implores her to hide her feelings, saying, Be silent, I implore you. Hide your pain deep in your heart. He who quietly bears painful wounds, with patience and an unspoken mind, may find healing. Hidden wrath finds strength when open hatred loses hope of vengeance. Some stoic philosophy from the nurse as she tries to persuade Medea to leave, but her mistress is determined to stay and have her vengeance. Creon enters and the nurse scurries off. He asks Medea why his order for her exile has not already been complied with. She laments her position and lyrically recalls her homeland and high position there, before again recalling how she saved Jason during his travels. The majority of the scene is her monologue, with their conversation confined to just a few short lines of dialogue. 
Creon argues that she carries guilt from her own father's death, and he is honouring Jason by making him his son-in-law. Realising that he won't be moved, she asks that he at least care for his children, so that they're not dragged down by her misfortune. He says he will, and then reluctantly agrees to delay her exile by a day. A choral song recalls the story of the search for the Golden Fleece, and questions the sense of a man leaving his homeland for unknown dangers and all the risks that sea travel entail. It's a wonderful evocation of time and place and travel, on a par, I would suggest, with Aeschylus as he recounted the journey of the beacons proclaiming victory at Troy as they made their way to Athens. The evocation of travel by sea is particularly strong, casting images that go all the way back to Homer, but which also speak to the expansion of the Roman Empire and the diversity and fruitfulness of the lands that now come under the emperor's control. The third act opens with the nurse trying to persuade Medea to change her resolve, but she won't hear of it and continues to describe her deep-seated need for vengeance. Jason enters and Medea gives him a lengthy reminder of how she helped him in the past. His only response is to say that, but for his entreaties, Creon would have had her killed already and that she should flee the city before the king changes his mind. She pleads for one last moment with her children and asks that he should forget the threatening words that she uttered in a moment of passion. As Jason leaves and the nurse returns, it becomes clear that Medea has no intention of leaving quietly and she immediately plans the presentation of a poisoned robe that she'll send to the palace as a gift for the unsuspecting bride. Another choral song describes Medea's rage as she plotted her revenge. The song opens like this. Fear not the power of fire, nor the raging gale or hurtling dart, or cloudy wind that brings the winter storms. Fear not when the Danube sweeps unchecked between its wide banks, nor when the Rhone hurries to the sea and the sun has broken the snow upon the hills. But a wife deserted, loving while she hates, this you should fear greatly. The flame of her anger burns bright, and she will not even fear kings nor bear their curbs. The song ends with incantations to the gods to keep Jason safe from Medea's vengeance. The nurse returns and speaks of her fear at Medea's jealous rage. Medea's curses on the royal family are strong, laced as they are with incantations to the gods of the underworld, snakes, blood and poisons. To this, the nurse says that Medea adds the venom of her words, as greatly to be feared as any poison. She stamps her feet, she sings her terrible song, and the world trembles. Medea is before the altar of Hecate, and in a long monologue of some hundred lines or so, makes lengthy threats, justifications and incantations. The robe is now primed to burn at the touch. She calls for her sons to deliver her precious gift, as she calls it, and to return quickly so that she might know one last embrace. After a short choral song where the fierce hatred born of Medea's love is cursed, a messenger enters proclaiming that the kingdom is lost. The king and his daughter lie dead. They've both been burned by the robe. The palace is on fire and water will not extinguish the magical flames. The city is in a state of fear. The nurse encourages Medea to leave the city quickly, but the death of Creon and his daughter does not satisfy her. Jason's betrayal still burns within her, and she cannot rid herself of the desire to harm him. She takes a sword and kills one of her sons. Hearing Jason and his men approaching, she leads her still living son and the nurse on the roof, carrying the body of her other son with her. Jason sees Medea on the roof and calls for the house to be taken. From the rooftop, she declaims, I have reclaimed my crown and throne. My brothers and my father, men of my homeland, hold the golden fleece again. My kingdom is won back, my lost virginity returns to me. The gods are appeased. Marriage and happy days be gone. My vengeance is complete, no, but not yet. Finish it while my hands are strong. Why delay? Why does my soul hesitate? I must, or all my anger comes to nothing. Jason orders the house to be set alight, but before it can take hold and with final taunts to Jason, she kills the child and throws both bodies down to the street. She's carried off by a chariot drawn by dragons. Jason has the closing lines as he says in bitter despair, Go through the heavenly skies. You will only find that the gods don't dwell in the heavens that you seek. It's all headedly strong stuff. 
Seneca could have done well by putting the maxim less is more into practice, but sadly he didn't. For all the strength of his language and the power of his poetry, in the end there is so much of it, the point driven hard at some length and repeatedly, it just loses its power. I'm reminded of horror films that set out to scare and shock, but become laughable because the horror and the gore is just too over the top. Much of the nearly 1,000 lines of the play are florid declamation rather than speeches that progress plot or define character. Speeches become rants, far too long to quote at anything near their full length, and thanks to that, Medea can only be seen as a monster with not a single redeeming feature. She is simply a vessel for vengeance, and one that has a track record with her previous killing of her father, which is often commented on and retold at length by the chorus. And then, of course, there is the final act, where she murders her children and then flings their bodies at Jason's feet from the rooftop. This is not the off-stage imagined and then presented violent act of the Greek theatre. This is on-stage action, the only dramatic action of the whole play, and a hugely impactful moment. However hardened the Romans were to staged and actual violence, surely this is a truly terrible scene, even for them. I do find it interesting that Seneca chose not to show the death of Creon and his daughter by means of the poisoned cloak, but to focus the dramatic action into this one scene at the end of the play. The donning of the poisoned cloak could have been a very dramatic scene, with king and princess dying a slow and painful death while throwing out powerful poetry but Seneca chose not to do that. There's no equivalent scene in Euripides, so in a sense he was simply following his model, but I think there's more to it than that. Creating a second very violent scene, showing the poisoning would, I think, have diluted the impact of the murder of the children and throwing their bodies from the rooftop, and I think Seneca wanted nothing to deflect from that scene and its impact. So we come back to the duality of his personality. Did this thoughtful philosopher want to see the audience cringe and turn away from the action on stage, shocked to the core? Would toe-good ladies fainting with shock have pleased him? Was outraged comment in the forum the next day what he was after? That sort of reaction does seem to be what was intended, and although we might agree that the Romans were more hardened to violence than we are, I think the actions here, a mother killing her children and treating their bodies with contempt in the name of vengeance, would have been very shocking. To the very end, Medea's lust for vengeance is not satisfied. When Jason pleads for the life of his remaining son, she says, Had it been that one life could satisfy my hands with blood, I would have slain none, but two is not enough. And then she draws out the final moment with, Now, grief, take your slow revenge. This is my day. It must not rush. Let me enjoy the moment. It is grotesque and chilling. This final scene is one of those that leads us to question whether the plays were written for recitation and staged reading rather than actual performance. Could this have been performed without looking false or even comic? Could dummies have been positioned on the rooftop and thrown down to represent the children's bodies and not looked faked and therefore ruin the moment? The house fronts of the Roman stage could have provided an upper level to represent the roof space Medea makes her escape from. The dragon that carries her off could have been a similar device to the Greek deus ex machina, but how the effect of the children's bodies being thrown from the roof was done is less clear to me. There's not a lot of information available about Roman stage machinery, but we do know that the Romans were incredibly innovative and great engineers and designers. They used suspended actors to represent gods, angels and other supernatural beings, used special effects and machinery like the deus ex machina and trapdoors. And all of this was not only in the theatre, but in the pageants, the triumphs and in the circus. So I wouldn't say that these events couldn't have been represented in some way. We just don't have any proof that they actually were. Seneca makes a point of emphasising the supernatural and divine aspects of Medea. Her backstory that she and the chorus retell carries through the play and emphasises her semi-divine genealogy and, particularly, her powers for casting spells. Although neither point is avoided in Euripides, Seneca emphasises both more. All of Seneca's plays feature the supernatural in the form of spells and poisons. This probably reflected a general belief in the powers of spells and witches that most Romans believed in, a good hook to catch an audience's interest with. 
For all that Medea's long tirades became overbearing, there are moments when the language is powerful and the imagery shines through. The scene where she is at her most witch-like is still overlong, but crafted in powerful language. As she prepares the poisonous robe in front of the altar of Hecate, the foreseeing of the certain fate of the innocent Creusa is truly terrifying. Now, Hecate, add the sting of poison, add the seeds of flame hid in my gift. Let them deceive the sight, but burn to the touch. Let the heat penetrate her very heart and veins, melt her limbs, consume her body in smoke. Her burning hair shall glow more brightly than any nuptial torch. Some commentators have suggested that Jason is a more sympathetic character, as he at least has a cogent argument for why he should leave Medea. But I don't find this particularly convincing. He's less petulant than in Euripides, but he's still just about as ineffectual. His most poignant moment is in the final lines of the play, when it's all too late and everything is lost. The horror of his situation tells him one thing, that he shouts in vain to his departing wife that she will not find the gods, because if they existed, these terrible, terrible events simply could not have happened. Perhaps inevitably, we have to compare Seneca's play to the more well-known and liked Euripides version. There are obvious comparisons in the plot, which is basically the same, but in the Euripides version, the action is driven by the characters, and of course by the gods, but for Seneca, it's more like the action offers a platform for the characters. Medea herself is presented in a significantly different way. Seneca's opening is dramatic with Medea's declaration of her hatred towards Jason and Creon. She is a fully formed monster from the start, whereas Euripides introduced her slightly later in his play as she was working through her grievances in discussion with the nurse. That gives the impression, at least, that a different decision, a different course of action, was still open to her. In the early part of the Euripides version, redemption and reconciliation are still possibilities. It doesn't last long, but it gives a side to her character and a path of development that is denied by Seneca. Consequently, the Greek chorus is much more sympathetic to her plight than they are in the Roman version. That's taken as a sign of the forward-thinking position Euripides held towards women in ancient Greece, while from the Roman point of view, it shows a stoic position, reflecting Seneca's own beliefs. The other big difference between Euripides and Seneca is in the final scenes where Medea doesn't directly blame Jason for the death of her children in the Roman version. Seneca seems determined to make Medea totally evil in every respect, as he has her take full responsibility for the crime and she carries out the act in full view of us all with a final brutality, throwing the children's bodies from the roof. Euripides has the act hidden in the tradition of his theatre, but he makes it clear that Medea holds Jason responsible for her actions that she has been forced into, and therefore she doesn't feel any guilt. Although that is central to the Euripides version of Medea, it's quite difficult to take, so in that respect, Seneca's version of Medea is perhaps easier to accept, if harder to watch. Of course, the play and the story were well known to the Greek and Roman audiences, so surprise at the outcome was not the point. But how Medea got to the decisions she made was, for Euripides at least. He was moving away from the idea that the gods controlled all of fate and trying to show that individuals could have effective choices. Now Medea is not the best example of this in Euripides because of the strength of the basic story and in particular because of the unthinkable acts that Medea commits. You might remember his Antigone as a better example of this possibility for individual choice. Seneca's message was perhaps directed more generally to question the beliefs of revenge and extreme behaviours driven by passion. He uses the nurse to contrast some of the concepts of stoicism in the face of adversity with Medea's overbearing passions. So we can argue that there is a discussion intended here, but the play isn't polemic by any means, and I'm inclined to think that a cathartic entertainment for his audience was Seneca's primary intention. At this point, having levelled quite a few criticisms at Seneca, I have to acknowledge that had it not been for Seneca and Senecan tragedy, the English stage could have developed in a very different way, and we may not have had Elizabethan and Jacobean drama as we know it. Most obviously, Senecan drama is divided into five acts, each with a varying number of scenes. There is in fact little, if any, reason for this structure. The divisions of scenes are driven by the entrances and exits of characters, but the division into five acts is little more than arbitrary. 
They are divided by a choral song of greatly varying length, which neither progresses nor explains the action, so are not grown organically from the structure of the play. However, the Tudor dramatists follow the pattern very rigidly in the early plays particularly, and then less so once we get to Shakespeare and his contemporaries. The chorus is used less and sometimes only as a prologue, sometimes omitted from one act division or another. The playwrights became less concerned with being slaves to the classical model and more with the structure of the play growing out of the flow of the action. As their confidence in the form grew, the chorus was dispensed with and the structure of the five-act play was built around rising or falling action and dramatic climax. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Roman comedy and tragedy came to England via Italian theatre of the Middle Ages and the schoolroom. Seneca was read for Latin education in the same way Terence was, and the early Tudor playwrights took from Seneca when they turned to tragedy, recognising that he addressed human decision-making and emotions in the way that the dominant theatre of the day did not. The dominant theatre of the day was the mystery play, and the mystery play simply retold an epic, usually biblical tale, where there was no concern for characterisation, motivation or development, and there was no concept of the unity of time and place within the play, even to the extent that in one famous example, Adam swears by Jesus as he sees Eve pluck the fruit from the tree in the Garden of Eden. When the early dramatists looked away from the Bible to the Latin Senecan models, they generally took the end part of the myth and dramatised that, showing the moment of crisis in a character's life, and how they dealt with the spiritual conflict that they faced. There were other influences, of course, not least the Reformation and the questioning of religion and development of science that burst forth at that time, but by taking Seneca as their starting point and refining his tool, they produced art that steadily became more subtle and focused on the inner conflicts of the individual. For example, the Senecan monologue, with all its overbearing bombast, becomes the Elizabethan soliloquy, where the thoughts of the individual are laid bare with honesty and clarity, and that has been a mainstay of theatre ever since. So for all the faults in his plays, we do have much from Seneca to be thankful for. I hope now that you have a good sense of the difficulty we have with understanding the two sides of Seneca's character, and how it was possible that for a long time he was thought of as two separate people. How did the gentle philosopher also produce this dark play and create such a sadistic character? It's tempting to draw parallels with Agrippina and the message that Seneca might have been trying to send to her and her son. We don't know when Seneca wrote his plays for sure, and as much as this is an interesting question to ponder, I don't think there's too much value in trying to tie his Medea too closely to the imperial court of the time, and to do so would be a disservice to Seneca. More likely, he was working to the tastes of his time, when the Roman audience wanted a big spectacle and high drama from their entertainments. For all its faults, this is a play that shocks, but it also entertains, and whether this was presented to a small audience or a large public gathering, I think it's safe to say that it had an impact on its intended audience. Next time we look at another Seneca play, Phaedra. He puts quite a different slant on the Hippolytus myth, but there is little let up in the vitriol and the overblown characters, and on this occasion the drama comes not from revenge, but from neglect, grief and lust. I look forward to your company next time. If you'd like to support the podcast, then please do find us on patreon.com or go to ko-fi.com to leave me a tip just to say thanks. If you have a moment to spare, please take a couple of minutes to rate the podcast and write a review on Apple Podcasts to help other theatre and history buffs find us. Any and all support helps offset the costs of hosting the podcast and the ever-expanding library of research materials and is gratefully received. Thank you so much for your support, and if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.